recording? Yes, sir. All right, everybody. Uh, here is uh, imperialism in the Ottoman um, Empire. And what we have here is, you know, the Ottoman Empire is large, it is diverse, um, it is old. And here is where nationalism, where all those little independent groups that belong to the Ottomans want to break, break away from us. Are you good? So, in 1798, Emperor Napoleon invades Egypt. He wanted to emulate his two big heroes, Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. And he's going to renew contact between the Islamic world, the Islamic empires, and the European world. The Ottomans are beginning to lose their grip on power because they had not caught up with the Industrial Revolution. You remember back with Mehed II and Suleiman, the Ottomans were as powerful, powerful, if not more powerful, than any other power in the world. But industrialization changes all of that. And the Europeans want their territory. This opens up the distinct possibility of Europeans getting access to either Ottoman territory or other Islamic territories. And by 1800, 50 years into the Industrial Revolution, the Muslim world extends from Morocco to North Africa, across the Middle East, all the way to India. Now down into Southeast Asia as far as Indonesia. Simply put, the Muslims simply control just an enormous swath of global territory on three continents. And for the last 300 years, from 1500 to 1800, we're controlled by the three great gunpowder empires. The Mughal Empire in India, the Safavid Empire in Iran, and the Ottoman Empire in Turkey and in the Middle East. And so by the early 1800s, all three empires are in stages of decline. They're old. The once dominant absolute monarchs were not strong enough to control their societies. So they're fighting internal wars, and they're going to be facing external pressures. Right? These large, diverse empires require a lot of time and effort to control while the Western imperialists are going to throw in the ingredient, ingredient to the mix of imperialism. They want territory. And as we saw in India and in Africa, the Western, will use, Western powers will use whatever tool they got in the toolbox, whatever technique is necessary, diplomatic, economic, even military, to get what they want. They will come out ahead no matter what. And in these smaller remote provinces, areas are going to look to their own self-interest. Again, they're not like UVA basketball, right? They don't understand that if they just do their role, the whole empire is going to function well. They don't see the global picture. They're just selfish. They're out for it themselves. And so just as the Austria um, Habsburg Empire lost territory, because of nationalism, how Italy formed itself into a, a nation is two opposites. Italy became stronger, while Austria-Hungary became weaker because they were diverse. They were all different. Well, the Ottomans are very similar. Um, just like Austrian Habsburgs, they've got a large multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire governed by a bunch of small populations. They did, however, control a wide swath of enormous territory, made up of many different people who wanted their own nations. The Greeks, the Romanians, Serbians, all wanted independence, even the um, Egyptians. 
That's just in, in Europe, in the Balkans, and then down in, in Asia, North Africa. There's Saudi Arabia, there's Lebanon, even Egypt. Um, all these are rebelling, and they're like the little Dutch boy trying to plug a leak. If they go down to Lebanon to hammer a rebellion, then one breaks out in Greece, and they run over to Greece, then you know, one breaks out you know, somewhere else. It's like Rome at the end of the empire. No matter what gap they plugged, another one opened up. If we're in Greece, then a rebellion breaks out in Saudi Arabia. And back and forth they go. A new protest would pop up. Now these rebellions are going to be suppressed, but in doing so, while running back and forth like playing ping pong in Forrest Gump, the Ottomans are going to lose one of their most precious territories and that is the country of Egypt in North Africa. In the midst of all of this, all right, we have the Great Crimean War, which we have talked about where once again, Madarash is looking for warm water port. We must find way to get big ports so we can export stuff to west. Well, as Russia and the Ottoman Empire engage in the Crimean War, 1853 to 1856. England and France, <laughs> mm, look at that. Oh, yes, looks very good, yes, very nice. <laughs> Bully old chap, why don't we offer to help out the Ottomans? England and France are like, look, man, we'll help you in exchange. Uh, we want some of your territory. Or we want to make friends because. When your empire collapses, which it's going to do very quick, <clears throat> boy, you know, back as a match and all that, all right, we're going to gain more territory. We can imperialize even easier because it's what we do, and we've got a, a presence in the region. Well, when the Ottomans accept European help, the Sultan looks at the new British industry and French power and he realizes that he'd fallen behind. It's just like Japan when Commodore Perry showed up. Oh, man, look at how far behind we are. And he also wants European military officers to train his Ottoman army. All right, this is what we need to do. And to do that, we're also going to need Western models of government and industrial techniques and, and, and tax collection ideas. Let's try and take what the West does and modify it to fit our great gunpowder um, empire. So just like everybody else, just like Japan, just like Sun Yat-sen sent Chiang Kai-shek abroad, he sends, the Ottomans do, young students. Go to the West. All right, go to Western colleges, study, and bring back what you learn. But when the kids come back, something different happens. They're not talking about how they can help the Sultan. They're talking about, yeah, elected, you know, representative democracy, Republican democracy, a nation of laws, where you hold elections. This is what we need to do. And equality for everybody. And someone's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm going to burn a full 60-second time out. Look, guys, I'm not talking about, like, equality and, and democracy. I'm a monarch, monarchical sultan. This is an empire. I am in charge. But by the group of 1890s, we get a group of young guys known as Young Turks. I guess I'm familiar with the term, Young Turk. So imagine in a, a business, all right, you have the old board of directors, the guys who built the company, and these are our established procedures and protocols. And all of a sudden, a bunch of young kids from Harvard and Yale Business School and Keenan Flagler and Fuquay Farina, well, what you guys want to do is do this, do this, and do this. And they're like, whoa, 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 young pup, easy. You know, cool your jets a little bit. This is how we do it here. Yeah, but you old guys are wrong. Excuse me? So you know how many billions of dollars we have made? Easy there. It'd be like a new young world history teacher coming in, go, Lega, this is what you need to do. Okay there, Skippy, you may have some good ideas and we can talk, but I've been doing this since, well, before you were born. So just, you know, easy a little bit. 
And it's not that young Turks are bad. A lot of times they may have some really great, good, innovative ideas, but they grate against the older establishment. And these young Turks, like, you know, the problem with the older establishment is they're tied to the Sultan. So we got to get rid of this guy. If we can get rid of the Sultan, maybe we can take over and our nation can grow. And so these young Turks are going to help instigate many rebellions and protests, causing the Ottomans to use up their resources. Resources, excuse me. And little by little, when the Ottoman Sultan is distracted, very sneakily, very subtly, like I told you, Professor um, uh, Moriarty, or, um, oh God, I can't remember his name because he's such a creep. Um, the guy from Bones that wouldn't let Bones and Booth um, get married, the creepy computer son's guy, I deleted him from my brain because I can't stand him um, so much. Nalant, Nilant, no. Um, Pallant, Pallant, that's my guy, all right? Very sneaky, very subtly, they slowly work their way in and control more and more of the Ottoman Empire. And it's all going to come to a head, um, here's the Young Turks, when they lose the Suez Canal. The Suez Canal is finally built a little over 100 miles. That will link the Mediterranean Sea with the Red Sea. You no longer that way, it's a shorter route to India and China. You no longer have to sail all the way around Africa and the Indian Ocean to get there. It's a big, dramatic shortcut. And here is the perfect example of imperialism, the way that, that Great Britain will achieve control over the Suez Canal. It also represents one of the biggest losses, as my son would say, that's a big L for the Ottoman Empire. And the Suez Canal is going to link the Mediterranean Sea with the Persian Gulf. Again, this gives you greater access to the Indian Ocean and for that matter even the um, Pacific Ocean. And after Napoleon invaded in 1798, a lot of people in Egypt saw the need for reform, just like everybody else. Wow, that Industrial Revolution is freaking awesome. Uh, what are we going to do here? So there is Egyptian leader Muhammad Ali, like the greatest boxer of all time, but here he is a, a Ottoman governor. Um, he makes sweeping changes for the Ottoman Empire. Um, when he does, he overhauls economic reforms, and under his leadership, Egypt is on the verge of being the first fully industrialized economy in the Middle East. Even though Egypt is in North Africa, it is associated with the Middle East. Um, taxation laws are rewritten, Everything is overhauled. Irrigation canals are built and, and updated and upgraded. And in Egypt, we have a brand new cotton industry. This is fantastic. Not only can you sail down over to the United States to get it, but also Egypt. And textiles, cloth, is a big industry, especially in Great Britain. And this cotton in the Suez Canal gives Egypt access to world trade. I cannot tell you how big this is. However, right as it's just about to gain traction in 1849, Muhammad Ali dies. He dies right when Europe has pretty much perfected their imperialism game. And the Europeans quickly pounce on Egypt. They're ready um, for this. Now, because of Napoleon and the French direct control system, the French <laughs> have a large influence in Egypt. And in fact, it is a French engineer who comes up with the idea to build a 100-mile canal to speed up trading with Eastern Asia. And he calls it the Suez Canal. Simple. Realizing that a ton of money could be made 
with the completion of the canal, the Egyptian government is all in. They seize the opportunity. We're going to build a canal through our country, and we're going to make money and profit off of modern industry. But by the late 1870s, the Egyptians are broke. They're out of money to build the canal. And the Egyptian governor, the prime minister, says, well, why don't we do it like this? Why don't we sell shares of the canal as if it was a corporation. We'll own 50, 51%, and we'll let other people invest, and we'll use their money to build the canal and slowly pay them back. Right? Now, that's a great way. It's also great and the necessary, only necessary way they're going to have to build the canal. So, the British government saw this <clears throat> bullet. <clears throat> The fish and chips is this all about? And they look at it. And they become very sneaky. Remember, the Brits are very, the British are very, 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 very good at this. The British Prime Minister, a guy named Disraeli, D-I-S-R-A-E-L-I, very quietly, very hush-hush, uses the money. Um, he borrows money from Parliament. Excuse me, I'm... I'm, you know, telling the story and not paying attention here. Uh, he gets money from Parliament, and they create a series of shell corporations, and with it, they buy the majority of shares, all right? You know, 10 here, 5% there, 8% there, and little by little by little, because everybody's kind of new at this game, the British have the majority of shares for the Suez Canal. They do it through many sources and companies. When it's all said and done, Disraeli's like, okay, this is what we want to do with the canal. And the Egyptians are like, whoa, 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 it's not your canal, it's ours. Well, how many shares of stock do you guys own? Because we have, oh, wait a minute, the majority share. And the Egyptians and the Ottoman Empire is like, oh, God. We just screwed up. England now controls the only water access between the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean. Everybody can use it, but part of the fee you pay, a bunch of it goes to merry old England. The English quickly spread the power and the influence they have over Egypt making it a British protectorate. Now, technically, the government of, of Egypt was controlled by the Ottoman Sultan, but after the Crimean War and the investment scheme, the British are in control. The Ottomans lose Egypt, while the British gain territory and a lot of money and control of a major, major, major trade route. So that is India um, Im imperialism. And we're going to back up a little bit here. I didn't know how fast we were going to get through this. Um, here's a little bit of India. And now what we're going to do here's some opium poppies. We're going to start China and new imperialism. I'm going to give you a, 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 primary, a couple primary documents when I get back. And we're going to take a, a look at them on Monday about new imperialism, or neo, N-E-O, imperialism. Now, neo-imperialism is a little different than traditional imperialism. In new imperialism, a larger country is going to acquire a smaller or weaker territory by controlling that smaller country's economy. We're not going to physically take you over. We are going to control your economy from afar. What would happen as an industrialized Western European country like Great Britain would invest a bunch of industrial capital, money, factories, equipment, machines, mechanized power, in a smaller, non-industrialized country. Here, 
The European country would build a powerful corporation, a multinational corporation. Coca-Cola, Nike, General Motors, Ford, Honda, British Petroleum, Shell, big, massive, you know, worldwide multinational corporations. They, the company, is going to do the imperializing instead of a country's government. The imperializing country and its companies are going to build a factory, they're going to build transportation facilities, ports, railroads, roadways, infrastructure, and to get the work done, they're going to hire native labor. Look, guys, we're helping you. We're giving you a job. This is for your benefit. We're giving you a salary. Like the little girl in Thailand getting a nickel an hour to sew the Nike swoosh on your shoes. Right? We're giving you a job. This is great for you. Love it. It's going to be awesome. And while they gave the people jobs, the Europeans at this time would force trade agreements that made them a lot more money. They always, always, always favored the Europeans. Whether it was military threat or it was outright bribery, government officials would become wealthy. They would even sell out their own people to get rich. And one of the best examples of neo-imperialism happens here in China. For centuries, China had controlled their own trade. Remember the Cantonese system. You guys can unload your cargo here, but you can't come indoors, or in the interior of, of China rather than indoors. But by the 1800s, the Western powers slowly began to impose their willpower on China. And along with that, their influence. As I said before this, the Cantonese system, Western countries were restricted to those small ports in the south of China. Being an ancient river valley civilization, China you know, the origin of the Silk Road had always been able to balance what it exported with what it imported to keep themselves on top. Going back to the Han Dynasty or Qin Dynasty and, you know, monopolies on gold and copper and salt, liquor. Well, the Europeans have had to deal with these trading laws until the Industrial Revolution. When the British asked for greatest trade rights in, in China, the Qing Emperor says, no, what do you British have that we want? Tea time? Give me a break. But industrialization changes everything. So it leads us here to the Great Opium War. In the late 1700s, the British realized they could trade opium grown in India which the British controlled and took for silver in China. The British would take the opium and sell it to the Chinese for silver. Now, opium, we know, is an addictive narcotic. You want more, and you want more. And the British say, well, sure, man, we'll give you more for your silver. So they're get, the British are making 100% profit. When the silver starts to run low, they say, hey... Um, instead of silver, we'll take your tea. We will then take it back to England, put some 20s, you know, Earl Grey hot wrappers on it, and we'll sell it again. We're doing minimal labor and making a bunch of money. For Great Britain, it's win-win. It's all about the money. It's all about profit. So when China wanted the opium trade stopped, the English government says... No. Why would we do that? So in 1839, Chinese ships are going to attack the Royal Navy, or Royal Naval uh, merchant vessels, starting what is known as the Opium War. And England is able to flex and show off their industrial power 
and their new navy as they destroy all the military efforts of China. And then they say, oh, you scratched the paint on one of our new ships, so you have to pay for this. And so the Treaty of Nanking is written, N-A-N-K-I-N-G. It was the first of a series of treaty, treaties where Great Britain slowly loses control of its trading. By 1842, Great Britain forces China to accept the Treaty of Nanking, which is a little nefarious because it gives the British the power to control trading with China. As soon as this happened, the floodgates are opened, all other industrial powers, France and the United States, drop their head and run in there as well. In 1899, the United States says, look, everybody should have access to China. As a result of the treaty, Great Britain also gets the island of Hong Kong and reparations payments. Payments, all right, to the damages to their ships of war caused by the wooden Chinese junks. This is called an indemnity or a reparation. And the British also say we get access to more ports throughout China. We get exclusive VIP um, treatment. We're number one in line. And to add insult to injury, I, I, I don't have it up here, um, Great Britain also demanded extraterritoriality. So it's extra and then territoriality, which means that British citizens in China are governed and followed by English law, not Chinese. The Chinese government has no power over them. So if a British citizen commits a crime or a British sailor commits a crime, he's not tried in a Chinese court. He's not subject to Chinese um, laws. It's British. And if you're a sailor and you're the captain ruling court over one of your sailors, are you going to find him guilty? No, get your butt back on the ship. And the biggest blow to, this is where we're going to stop here, to Great Britain, to China, was when Great Britain demands something known as the Most Favored Nation Clause. Now, remind me of this on Monday, and I'll explain it a little better. Um, the Most Favored Nation Clause is a big deal. Even today, if you've got a Most Favored Nation Clause, you get the same or better rights than all of the competitors. So no matter what deal your competitors negotiate, you always get to um, beat them. Here's a simple example. To pull up to a, a pier, a dock in China, you got to pay five bucks, all right, port fees. Well, the French will, you know, <laughs> bring over some champagne and some crepes. They will negotiate a $4 payment to tie up at the same dock. Because Great Britain is the most favored nation, their price automatically drops to $3.50. Right? No matter what deal you get, England always gets the best deal. And as a result, here's where we'll stop, is the Great Taiping Rebellion. As a result of these treaties, problems begin to grow for the Qing Dynasty. As its power begins to fade, as the European powers begin to carve them up, China experiences another population boom, which makes it really difficult to feed the people. Plus, some of the old river valley irrigation networks are out of date and they flood out of control. So many more people are living in poverty. While the emperor is living this lavish life of luxury, his people are suffering. And at this time, major advances had been made in the world. The transcontinental cable linking Europe to North America had been laid. 
Karl Marx had writes the Communist Manifesto. While the rest of the world is moving forward, while Japan is getting ready to undergo the Meiji Restoration, China is still stuck. And a former, it's always these guys' teacher, named Zhu Quan, began to speak out against the Qing Rebellion, or the Qing Dynasty. And his efforts culminate in what is known as the Taiping Rebellion. In this rebellion, nearly 20 million Chinese people are killed between 1850 and 1854, almost the exact same time the Crimean War is going on. And, you know, Zhu Quan wanted land reform for his peasants. He wanted better education for young people, better treatment of women, and most of all, the most important thing he wanted was to end the dynasties that had governed China for thousands and thousands of years. And it almost worked. The Qing dynasty was pushed to its limits. It was on its knees. And it was forced to reply, rely on the old warlord provinces um, to back the warlords in the provinces, the proximity to authority guys. And while China was dealing with its own internal disorder, once again, the European powers from Great Britain, from Germany, um, to even Japan begin to encroach. We're going to stop there. I'll pick it up here on Monday. Hope you guys have had a fantastic day.